Hi everyone, and I hope you are keeping well. Today is our last day of the week um, for reading The Hobbit, and we are on chapter five today, which you can find on page 81. Yesterday we read about the goblins and the cave, and that was just a little bit scary, but I'm excited to see what happens next. It's been a long time since I read this book, um, so I hope you're enjoying it. So let's have a start. Chapter five is called Riddles in the Dark. When Bilbo opened his eyes, he wondered if he had, for it was just as dark as when he'd shut had them shut. No one was anywhere near him. Just imagine his fright. He could hear nothing, see nothing, and he could feel nothing except the stone of the floor. Very slowly he got up and groped about on all fours till he touched a wall of the tunnel, but neither up nor down it could he find anything. Nothing at all. No sign of goblins. No sign of dwarfs. His head was swimming, and he was far from certain even of the direction they'd been going in when he had his fall. He guessed as well as he could and crawled along for a good way, till suddenly his hand met with what felt like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. He put the ring in his pocket, almost without thinking. Certainly it did not seem of any particular use at that moment. He did not go much further, but sat down on the cold floor and gave himself up to complete miserableness for a long while. He thought of himself frying bacon and eggs in his own kitchen at home, for he could feel inside that it was high time for some meal or other, but that only made him miserabler. He could not think what to do, nor could he think what had happened, or why he had been left behind. Or why? If he had just been left behind, the, goblin, the goblins had not caught him or even why his head was so sore. The truth was he'd been lying quiet, out of sight and out of mind, in a very dark corner for a long while. After some time he felt for his pipe. It was not broken and that was something. Then he felt for his pouch and there was some tobacco in it and that was something more. Then he felt for matches and he could not find any at all and that shattered his hopes completely. Just as well for him as he agreed when he came to his senses. Goodness knows what the striking of matches and the smell of tobacco would have brought on him out of dark holes in that horrible place. Still at the moment he felt very crushed, but in slapping all of his pockets and feeling all round himself for matches, his hand came on the hilt of his little sword, the little dagger that he'd got from the trolls and that he had quite forgotten, nor fortunately had the goblins noticed it as he wore it inside his breeches. <coughs> Excuse me. Now he drew it out. It shone pale and dim before his eyes. So it is an Elvis blade too, he thought, and goblins are not very near, and yet not far enough. But somehow he was comforted. It was rather splendid to be wearing a blade made in Gondolin for the goblin wars, of which so many songs have sung. And also he had noticed that such weapons made a great impression on goblins that came upon them suddenly. Go back, he thought. No good at all. Go sideways? Impossible. Go forward. Only thing to do. On we go. And up he got and trotted along with his little sword held in front of him and one hand feeling the wall and his heart all of a pitter patter. Now certainly Bilbo was in what is called a tight place, but you might remember it was not quite as tight for him as it might have been for me or for you. Hobbits are not quite like ordinary people and after all if their holes are nice cheery places and properly aired, quite different from the tunnels of the goblins. Still, they are more used to tunnelling than we are, and they do not easily lose their sense of direction underground, not when their heads have recovered from being bumped. Also, they can move very quietly and hide easily and recover wonderfully from falls and bruises, and they have a fund of wisdom and wise sayings that men have mostly never heard or have forgotten long ago. I should not have liked to have been in Mr Baggins' place all the same, the tunnel seemed to have no end. All he knew was that it was still going down pretty steadily and keeping in the same direction in spite of a twist and a turn or two. There were passages leading off to the side every now and then, as he knew by the glimmer of his sword or could fill with his hand on the wall. Of these he took no notice, except to hurry past for fear of goblins or half-imagined dark things coming out of them. On and on he went, and down and down, and still he heard no sound of anything except the occasional whir of a bat by his ears, which startled him at first. 
till it became too frequent to bother about. I do not know how long he kept on like this, hating to go on, not daring to stop, on and on, until he was tireder than tired. It seemed like all the way to tomorrow and over it to the days beyond. Suddenly, without any warning, he trotted splash into water. Ugh! It was icy cold. That pulled him up sharp and short. He did not know whether it was just a pool in the path or the edge of an underground screen that's crossed the passage or the brink of a deep, dark subterranean lake. The sword was hardly shining at all. He stopped and he could hear when he listened hard. Drops, drip, drip, dripping from an unseen roof into the water below. But there seemed no other sort of sound. So it is a pool or a lake and not an underground river, he thought. Still, he did not dare to wade out into the darkness. He could not swim, and he fought too at nasty, slimy things with big, bulging, blind eyes wriggling in the water. There are strange things living in the pools and lakes and the hearts of mountains. Fish whose fathers swam in, goodness only knows how many years ago, and never swam out again, while their eyes grew bigger and bigger from trying to see in the blackness. Also, there are other things more slimy than fish. Even in the tunnels and caves the goblins have made for themselves, there are other things loving unbeknown to them that have sneaked in from outside to lie up in the dark. Some of these caves, too, go back in their beginnings to ages before the goblins, who only widened them and joined them up with passages, and the original owners are still there in odd corners, slinking and nosying about. Deep down here by the dark water lived old Gonham, a small, slimy creature. I don't know where he came from, nor who or what he was. He was Gollum, as dark as darkness, except for two big round pearl eyes in his thin face. He had a little boat and he rowed about quite quietly on the lake, for lake it was, wide and deep and deadly cold. He paddled it with large feet dangling over the side, but never a ripple did he make. Not he. He was looking out of his pale lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat too. Goblin, he thought good, when he could get it, but he took care they never found him out. He just throttled them from behind if they ever came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about. They very seldom did, for they had a feeling that something unpleasant was lurking down there, down at the very roots of the mountain. They had come on the lake when they were tunnelling down long ago, and they found they could go no further, so there their road ended in that direction, and there was no reason to go that way, unless the great goblin sent them. Sometimes he took a fancy for fish from the lake, and sometimes neither goblin nor fish came back. Actually, Gollum lived on a slimy island of rock in the middle of the lake. He was watching Bilbo now from the distance with his pale eyes like telescopes. Bilbo could not see him, but he was wondering a lot about Bilbo, for he could see that he was no goblin at all. Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island, while Bilbo was sitting on the brink, altogether flummoxed, and at the end of his way, and his wits. Suddenly, up came Gollum, and whispered and hissed, Bless us and splash us, my precious. I guess it's a choice feast. At least a tasty morsel it'd make us, Gollum. And when he said Gollum, he made a horrible swallowing nose in, noise in his throat. That is how he got his name, though he always called himself My Precious. The hobbit nearly jumped out of his skin when the hiss came in his ears, and he suddenly saw the pale eyes sticking out at him. Who are you? And he suddenly saw the pale eyes again. What is he, my precious? whispered Gollum, who always spoke to himself, though never having anyone else to speak to. This is what he had come to find out, for he was not really very hungry at the moment, only curious, otherwise he would have grabbed first and whispered afterwards. I am Mr Bilbo Baggins. I have lost the dwarfs and I have lost the wizard and I don't know where I am and I don't want to know if only I can get away. What's he got in his handsies? said Gollum looking at the sword, which he did not quite like. A sword, a blade which came out of Gondolin. Sss, said Gollum and became quite polite. Perhaps she sits here and chats with it a bit, see, my precious. It likes riddles, perhaps it does, does it? He was anxious to appear friendly at any rate for the moment, and until he found out more about the sword and the hobbit, whether he was quite alone really, whether he was good to eat, and whether Gollum was really hungry. Riddles were all he could think of. 
Asking them and sometimes guessing them had been the only game he'd ever played with other funny creatures sitting in their holes in the long, long ago before he lost all his friends and was driven away alone and crept down, down into the dark under the mountains. Very well, said Bilbo, who was anxious to agree, until he found out more about the creature, whether he was quite alone, whether he was fierce or hungry, and whether he was friend of the goblins. You ask first, he said, because he had not had time to think of a riddle. So Gollum hissed. What has roots as nobody sees is taller than trees. Up, up it goes, and yet never grows. Easy, said Bilbo. Mountains, I suppose. Does it get easy? It must have a competition with us, my precious. If precious us and it doesn't answer, we eats it, my precious. If it asks us and we doesn't answer, then he does what it wants, eh? We shows it the way out, yes? All right, said Bilbo, not daring to disagree and nearly bursting his brain to think of riddles that could save him from being eaten. Thirty white horses on a red hill. First they champ, then they stamp, then they stand still. That was all he could think of to ask. The idea of eating was rather on his mind. It was rather an old one too, and Gollum knew the answer as well as you do. Chestnuts, chestnuts, he hissed. Teeth, teeth, my precious. But we has only six. Then he asked his second. Voiceless it cries, wingless flutters, toothless bites, mouthless mutters. Half a moment, cried Bilbo, who was still thinking uncomfortably about eating. Fortunately, he had once heard something rather like this before, and getting his wits back, he thought of the answer. Wind. Wind, of course, he said, and he was so pleased that he made up one on the spot. This will puzzle the nasty little underground creature, he thought. An eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face. That eye is like to this eye, said the first eye, but in low place, not in high place. Sss, said Gollum. He had been underground a long, long time and was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the wretch would not be able to answer, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages and ages before when he lived with his grandmother in a hole in the bank by a river. S my precious, he said, sun on the daisies, it means it does. But these ordinary, above ground, everyday sort of riddles were tiring for him. Also, they reminded him of days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty, and that put him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry, so this time he tried something a bit more difficult and more unpleasant. It cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life, kills laughter. Unfortunately for Gollum, Bilbo had heard that sort of thing before, and the answer was all around him anyway. Dark, he said, without even scratching his head or putting on his thinking cap. A box without hinges, key or lid, yet golden treasure inside is hid. He asked to gain time, until he could think of a really hard one. This, he thought, a dreadfully easy chestnut, though he had not asked it in the usual words. But it proved a nasty poser for Gollum. He hissed to himself, and still he did not answer. He whispered and spluttered. After some while, Bilbo became impatient. Well, what is it, he said. The answer's not a kettle boiling. Over, as you seem to think from the noise you're making. Give us a chance. Let it give us a chance, my precious. Well, said Bilbo, after giving him a long chance. What about your guess? But suddenly Gollum remembered thieving from Ness long ago and sitting under the river bank teaching his grandmother, teaching his grandmother to suck. Eggsies, he hissed, eggsies it is. Then he asked, alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking, all in mail, never clinking. He also in his turn thought this was a dreadfully easy one because he was always thinking of the answer. But he could not remember anything better at the moment. He was so flustered by the egg question. All the same, it was a poser for poor Bilbo, who never had anything to do with the water if he could help it. I imagine you know the answer, of course, or can guess it as easy as winking, since you are sitting comfortably at home and have not the danger of being eaten to disturb your thinking. Bilbo sat and cleared his throat, <clears throat> but no answer came. After a while, Gollum began to hiss with pleasure to himself. Is it nice, my precious? Is it juicy? Is it scrumptiously crunchable? He began to peer at Bilbo out of the darkness. 
Half a moment, said the hobbit shivering. I gave you a good long chance just now. It must make haste, haste, said Gollum, beginning to climb out of his boat onto the shore to get at Bilbo. But when he got his long webby feet in the water, a fish jumped out in fright and fell on Bilbo's toes. Ugh, he said, it was cold and clammy. And so he guessed, fish, fish, he cried, it is fish. Gollum was dreadfully disappointed, but Bilbo asked another riddle as quick as ever he could, so that Gollum had to get back into his boat and think. No legs lay on one leg. Two legs sat near on three legs. Four legs got some. It was not really the right time for this riddle, but Bilbo was in a hurry. Gollum might have had some trouble guessing it if he had asked it another time. As it was, talking of fish, no legs was not so very difficult, and after that the rest was easy. Fish on a little table, man at table sitting on the stool, the cat has the bones. That, of course, is the answer, and Gollum soon gave it. Then he thought the time had come to ask something hard and horrible. This is what he said. This thing all things devours. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers, gnaws, iron, bites, still, grinds hard, stones to mill, slays kings, ruins town, and beats high and mountain down. Poor Bilbo sat in the dark, thinking of all the horrible names of all the giants and ogres he'd ever heard told of in tales, but not one of them had done all these things. He had a feeling that the answer was quite different and that he ought to know it, but he could not think of it. He began to get frightened, and that is bad for thinking. Gollum began to get out of his boat. He flapped into the water and paddled to the bank. Bilbo could see his eyes coming towards him. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth. He wanted to shout out, give me more time, give me more time. But all that came out with a sudden squeal was, time, time. Bilbo was saved by pure luck, for that, of course, was the answer. Gollum was disappointed once more, and now he was getting angry and also tired of the game. It had made him very hungry indeed. This time he did not go back to the boat. He sat down in the dark by Bilbo. That made the hobbit most dreadfully uncomfortable and scattered his wits. It's got to ask us a question, my precious. Yes, yes, yes. Just one more question to guess. Yes, yes, said Gollum. But Bilbo simply could not think of any question with that nasty, wet, cold thing sitting next to him and pouring and poking him. He scratched himself, he pinched himself. Still, he could not think of anything. Ask us, ask us, said Gollum. Bilbo pinched himself and slapped himself. He gripped on his little sword. He even felt in his pocket with his other hand. Then he found the ring he had picked up in the passage and forgotten about. What have I got in my pocket? he said aloud. He was talking to himself, but Gollum thought it was a riddle and he was frightfully upset. Not fair, not fair, he hissed. It isn't fair, my precious, is it, to ask us what it's got in its nasty little pocketsies? Bilbo, seeing what had happened and having nothing better to ask, stuck to his question. What have I got in my pocket? he said louder. Sss, hissed Gollum. It must give us free guesses, my precious, free guesses. Very well, guess away, said Bilbo. Hansies, said Gollum. Wrong, said Bilbo, who was luckily just taken his hand out again. Guess again. Sss, said Gollum, more upset than ever. He thought of all the things he kept in his own pockets. Fish bones, goblin's teeth, wet shells, a bit of bat wing, a sharp stone to sharpen his fangs on and other nasty things. He tried to think what other people kept in their pockets. Knife, he said at last. Wrong, said Bilbo, who had lost his own time ago. Last guess. Now Gollum was in a much worse state than when Bilbo had asked him the egg question. He hissed and spluttered and rocketed himself backwards and forwards and slapped his feet on the floor and wriggled and squirmed. But still he did not dare to waste his last guess. Come on, said Bilbo, I'm waiting. He tried to sound bold and cheerful, but he did not feel at all sure how the game was going to end, whether Gollum guessed right or not. Time's up, he said. String or nothing, shrieked Gollum, which was not fair, working in two guesses at once. Both wrong, cried Bilbo, very much relieved, and he jumped at once to his feet, put his back to the nearest wall and held up his little sword. He knew, of course, that the riddle game was sacred and of immense acquiry, and even wicked creatures were afraid to cheat when they played at it. But he felt he could not trust this slimy thing to keep any promise at a pinch. Any excuse would do for him to slide out of it. And after all, that last question 
had not been a genuine riddle according to the ancient laws. And we'll stop there today and we will come back and see if Gollum can guess what is in Mr Bilbo Baggins' pocket. See you next week.